Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, to those who will be watching this recording, um, the topic for today is High Flex for Student Access and, stu and Success, Recommendations for Pedagogy, Hardware, and Software. My name is Dr. Ingrid Greenberg. I am the online faculty mentor coordinator for the San Diego College of Continuing Education. Um, Jessica, do, would you like to say hello? Hi, I'm Jessica Varnado Swal. I am a lead online faculty mentor, uh, academic senate secretary, and I also serve as the co-chair of our distance education committee here at the San Diego College of Continuing Education. And Gia. Hi, everyone. My name is Gia Sun. I am the ESL Digital Literacy uh, Coordinator for San Diego College of Continuing Education. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I always like to show a slide about how we collaborate at the San Diego College of Continuing Education. We do have a belief that we are better together as we serve our students. And this is a collage of images and screen captures from all the hard work and commitment to um, our pilot for high flex instruction. And um, there's images here from Zoom professional development trainings with our faculty and staff. And um, there's a couple images of us on campus as we leave um, the fully online Zoom classes. We're now venturing onto the campus. We're going to the brick and mortar classroom and we are starting to teach from the sites um, on campus. So you can see um, in a couple images, um, the instructor and instructional aid sitting in the front of the class. That one's in the lower right-hand corner. Also in the top right-hand corner, you see an image of a Canvas uh, screen capture. Canvas is our learning management system that we use to connect with our learners, to help them learn material from our classes. And that is used um, for students who are connecting with our class asynchronously at a distance, at a different time than our uh, synchronous classes. So um, we are, we've been collaborating since spring 2021, and we're really excited to be sharing some of our lessons learned and our best practices and recommendations to you. So today's agenda will be um, our enrollment. And one of the reasons uh, why we decided to embrace this brand new um, teaching modality called HyFlex. And we'll be um, doing a quick overview of a literature review for HyFlex research. And then we'll explore some opportunities, challenges, best practices, and lessons learned from our HyFlex pilot. And then finally, we will be making our recommendations. So um, we like to cite Dr. Beatty. He's a professor at San Francisco, uh, Cal State San Francisco um, in California. And he has published an e-textbook about high flex instruction and methodology. So he asked two key questions. And the first one is, under which conditions is implementing a student-directed approach like HyFlex worth the cost or worth the investment? And we will be describing the many ways we've used um, CARES Act funding and HERF funding to support this pilot, both um, for um, staffing and uh, technology purchases. The second question Dr. Beatty proposes is, do we have those conditions at our institution, college, department, or in our courses? And in the next couple of slides, we'll be talking about one reason we decided to return to campus in a high flex modality. So student enrollment was our main reason for returning to campus. Um, many of our adult education students are getting new jobs or they're getting more hours in their current jobs. So as our students return to work, they have less time to 
um, study fully online. So we wanted to find a new way to reach our learners. Now, during the pandemic, some of our students, they did not adapt readily to online education. They, um, because of the digital divide, did not have access to the internet or computer technology for them to use Zoom web conferencing or Canvas learning management system. So um, we really wanted to use HyFlex instruction, which offers kind of the best of both worlds on campus instruction with Zoom and fully online instruction. Also our adult education students, they have very fluid lifestyles. They um, are caregivers, they work, um, their schedules frequently change due to work. And so um, we wanted to give them more flexibility in how they participate in our classes. And our belief is that the high flex approach will do so. Um, and then uh, one more uh, enrollment topic and technology topic, our accreditation um, route. One of our goals as a college institution is um, to grow the enrollment and student access and student success. And while doing so, we maintain and secure technology to support um, instruction and student services. So it's important at this time to talk about definitions because HyFlex is a relatively new approach um, to teaching, especially in adult education. And um, it's a combination of two words, hybrid and flexible. So hybrid combines both online and face-to-face -face teaching and learning activities. And flexible means that our students can choose whether or not to attend face-to-face -face on campus or on Zoom with no learning deficit between the two modalities. Um, now, Dr. Beatty also reported that uh, when students have a choice like this, we want to make sure that um, whether we're teaching to the Zoom audience or the on-campus audience, that there are equivalent learning experiences um, in both online and on campus. So one way we do that is when we're using Zoom, we use a breakout room for conversation, pair practice, or group communication with our students. Now, if you're on campus, instead of using Zoom breakout rooms, what we use um, as an instructor, we ask our students to meet in pairs or groups and to have a conversation or dialogue around a topic. Um, also, um, Dr. Beatty recommends that we identify equivalent learning outcomes, that in both scenarios, whether students are learning in a Zoom breakout room or on campus in pairs, they will demonstrate similar communication skills. So that's something um, that we're always looking for that um, Dr. Beatty recommended um, through his research, equivalent learning ex experiences and equivalent learning outcomes. So I really like um, this participation path illustration and what it shows us, um, there's three or four column, three columns on starting on the left is week one, then week two and week three. So in week one, the student can choose. They either start OL, meaning online learning, or they start FTF, which is face to face, meaning on ground, on campus, in the classroom. So a student can start fully online and then they can choose um, in week two to again go fully online, and then in week three again to go fully online. So this student is fully online all three weeks. Now, conversely, another student may say, hey, wait a minute, um, I wanna start face-to-face -face on campus. I'm not that strong with computer technology. I'm gonna go to campus. So they might start face-to-face um, -face on campus. Um, and then their second week, they may continue on campus. But in week three, 
Um, maybe someone in their family loans them a laptop and they decide to go fully online. So um, that would be a different participation path. And so in the high flex modality, students have choice. They can choose any one of these participation paths. So here's another way to look at it for those of us who enjoy math and um, looking at things like in a, in a statement. After three weeks, there can be up to eight different participation paths available, two to the power of three. Um, and if we extend this participation path um, into a 12-week class, we can see more than 4,000 possible paths for our students where they can choose between fully online or on campus face-to-face. -face. So that would be 4,096. So those are the different participation paths that high flex students can choose um, when we're offering high flex instruction. Um, let's see, Jessica or Gia, did you want to talk about our milestones? Um, yes, and I also just wanted to let everybody know that apparently there is a tech glitch. A lot of our colleagues are currently waiting to be let in and we're not able to make it for some technical reason. And I see a few more people have joined us. Thank you so much. Did you have technical difficulties as well? to a different session that happened at one o'clock this afternoon. So I logged into a different three o'clock session and she gave me like a private link to kind of go in the back way to your session here. Oh, okay. I'll share the back link that they gave because if you guys know anyone who's interested in uh, joining us, this is the link I'm gonna share it with everyone. This thank is what they gave you. me. Yes, Carl, thank you so much. And in fact, I think I was the one that shared that with you and I've also updated the back end of vFairs with the right link. So apologies, and I'm gonna push out a notification through the platform to invite anyone who was interested so they should see that notification here in about 60 seconds. Fabulous, thank you so thank much you. for doing yeah. that. So Absolutely. I wasn't sure if we wanted to like reintroduce ourselves or keep going. What do you think, Ingrid? Sure. Um, do you want me to go back to the first slide or we'll introduce ourselves from here? I think from here is okay. What do yeah. You think, mm -hmm. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Ingrid Greenberg. I'm with San Diego College of Continuing Education, and I am the online faculty mentor coordinator. So happy you're here today. Thank you for being patient. Jessica? Hi, I'm Jessica Varnado Swal, and I am an ESL instructor as well as a, a online faculty mentor. I serve as co-chair of our distance ed committee here at College of Continuing Education. And I also am on Academic Senate as secretary and my colleague Gia. Hi everyone, my name is Gia Sun and I am the ESL Digital uh, Literacy Coordinator for San Diego College of Continuing Education. All right, thank you so much. Jessica, do you wanna uh, review the milestones of our HyFlex pilot? Certainly, so we started in the summer um, in May of 2021, although we, we had gotten some news about the OWL device before that. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with the OWL device. Um, it, one of the only departments that or the first departments that have started with our high flex pilot was the ESL department, which all three of us are from. Um, so we did um, a field test when we first got the owls back in May. Um, and then in June, we actually ran a class with our online students with some instructors as like example, face-to-face -face students in the audience. Uh, in June. Then in July, um, we had a presentation from our vendor about some more permanent solutions for video and audio, which unfortunately due to supply chain issues, we still have not received. We're very much dependent on these mobile OWL devices. Um, and then in July, we did some more field testing with laptops and tablets as an alternative to the OWL. Um, uh, I personally ran an example with my summer class that a lot of instructors were able to attend who had been assigned a high flex assignment for fall, um, and they took the place of the face-to-face -face students. 
Um, then very quickly after that, since September 7th is the beginning of our semester, we were able to do a lot of training for instructional aides and faculty in August to get us ready for that September 7th launch. Um, so Ingrid, would you like to cover the equity angle and then I can... Yeah, well, um, it worked out really well in the summer. We had a team of equity cultural curriculum instructors meeting to discuss um, how can we deepen our equity practices on our campus and for our students? So um, myself, Robert Jackson, and Brian Palmiter, we analyzed our findings after working with the vendor on July 7th. And those, uh, that analysis really shaped our approach to how do we develop both pedagogy and hardware, and then third least, um, uh, the uh, student uh, services. How do we develop those three um, practices based on the analysis? So even though we found many weaknesses in the July 7th presentation, it helped us develop the materials for high flex and the pedagogy. And um, it helped us further explore the hardware like the microphones and the video and laptops. And how are we going to how are we going to do that? And I'm going to share some of those findings with you in a moment. Um, let's see, Gia, do you want to talk about the ESL program team? Mm -hmm. Yes, so we have our uh, Dean Jan Duro and uh, Monica Quiva uh, is a technology coordinator uh, and myself, the digital literacy coordinator and also our wonderful um, faculty mentor, Jessica Bernardo Swan uh, as the ESL program team to support all the high flex um, teachers uh, with professional development and all the support they need. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Gia. So um, after our analysis, here were some of the themes we found uh, after the July 7th technology demonstration. Um, so some of the strengths were that when the vendor used a stationary video camera um, that had a remote control for a Zoom, um, we found the video quality was extremely high for the presenter the whiteboard and the overhead projector. And the audio quality was very high for the presenter who was wearing a lavalier microphone, okay? But there were a number of weaknesses. The first weakness was what we call a ghost presenter. Sometimes the um, presenter walked away from the camera, the view of the camera, and it was like, hey, where's, Where's the presenter? Where did the teacher go? So for some of us, this created anxiety. We were asking, hey, is my Zoom malfunctioning? What happened to the presenter? Where did he go? And so um, we wanted, of course, to address this as we were field testing in the summer. Um, the second weakness was that the instructor had to initiate selections or changes of the video presets on the video camera. So the camera was in the rear of the in-class um, campus classroom. And so the video, um, as it did a zoom from the rear of the classroom, you know, you're like, it took time with the remote control to manage that, um, the zooming of that video camera. Um, also, because that video camera was stationary, it was on a tripod, you couldn't take it into a lab situation like an automotive lab or maybe a culinary arts lab or a sewing lab. You couldn't walk around with it. The uh, video was preset, locked down on a tripod like it was standing on a five foot tripod. Some of the other weaknesses were audio, and this was um, a bit of a frustration. Um, the um, faculty and staff who were on campus, they did not have a microphone. So those of us who are on Zoom, 
we could not hear the dialogue and the questions from the faculty and staff on campus. Um, even though we, those of us on Zoom asked the presenter to repeat the question and dialogue, it didn't really happen. Um, also the Zoom audience, we couldn't determine when the instructor was um, speaking to the in-class audience. And um, so some, sometimes those of us on Zoom, we thought there were technology malfunctions. Also, let's talk about teacher presence and student presence. Um, I mentioned this earlier, we um, talked about like a ghost presenter, the presenter would sometimes walk away from the view of the camera, and we would be left without um, an instructor or a teacher presence. Um, lack of audio and visual classroom presence, so we, the, um, those of us on Zoom could not interact with those who were on campus. So we could not imagine um, student engagement between the Zoom audience and the classroom audience. So um, what we landed on is that our high flex students are going to be participating in at least three modalities. And from left to right, I have three images. So the first one is what we call on-site synchronous. On-site means on campus or in adult education, we frequently rent out spaces um, at high schools or gymnasiums and um, other community centers. So any kind of brick and mortar um, campus or site. So that's number one. And synchronous means at the same time or simultaneous. So um, you see here in this image, an instructor is walking into the front of her classroom and behind her is a board a projection of the Zoom audience, the students who are on Zoom. So simultaneously, you see students um, um, being able to uh, see um, the Zoom students as well as the classroom students. In the second image, it's what we call Zoom synchronous. This is the Zoom audience. Students are typically in their homes. Sometimes our students will join, like if they're on break from work or um, sitting in a car waiting uh, for soccer practice to end. So um, here in this particular image, you see a student sitting at a home desk in front of a sewing machine. And the student is also watching a laptop uh, Zoom uh, class of an instructor providing instruction for the sewing class. So this is again called Zoom synchronous. And that is a simultaneous, um, this instructor is providing instruction um, to the Zoom audience and to students in the um, classroom on campus. And then in the third image on the far right, um, you see a screen capture of my high flex class that I've been teaching this fall. And it's a beginning ESL high flex class for literacy students. And I did a screen capture from my Canvas class, and um, it's the home page. And you can see um, a photo of me and my co-teacher, Drea. Um, and so we co-teach this high flex class. So um, there's really three main modalities that we are piloting right now. Um, on-site synchronous, Zoom synchronous, and then the Canvas learning management system is what we call asynchronous, meaning at a different time. So um, students can access our Canvas course at a different time outside of the synchronous um, Zoom classes. Um, and I'm going to just take a pause here. I know some of us, some of the uh, today, some of you have joined us late. Are there any questions, comments, or observations at this time? Anything coming up in the chat, Jessica? We're good. Okay. Great. Feel free to um, type uh, in the chat your questions, and one of us will catch those questions. All right, Jessica, do you want to talk about live streaming and broadcasting guidelines? Certainly, yeah. So our Zoom students are like 
we weren't sure which term to use, live stream, broadcasted. We show them on the projector so that the in-person students can see the other students. Um, so they are live streamed in the classroom. Um, and then we, our district has made some camera, I think they changed the name from guidelines. It's like camera, what was it, Ingrid? You, we were looking at it today. Recommendations. Recommendations. Um, so just in order, because if you're on Zoom, it's very easy for you to turn off your camera or change your name. Um, so just to let our Zoom students know that that is a possibility if they don't wanna show their face, they can um, change their name or turn off their camera um, and make sure that uh, students are able to keep their privacy. Um, also, the on-campus students can be live streamed or broadcasted only if the cameras are pointed towards the classroom, towards the seated students. Um, and again, we want to make sure that we would have, you know, authorization um, and anybody who wanted to maintain privacy can, because these recordings generally are made available to the class on Canvas later. All right, so this is a view from one of our OWL cameras that many instructors in the ESL program are using, although not all, we've been experimenting with several different devices and ways of providing um, the stream from the classroom and from Zoom. Um, so if you're on Zoom the, and if the instructor or classroom OWL camera is spotlighted, this is the view that you would see. So just like a normal Zoom call, you can have that top row of the Zoom live stream or broadcast on the top or on the side, or you could just see the speaker, depending on um, what you choose as your view on Zoom. But the OWL view is actually the two lower like, layers on here. So this one in the middle, the classroom live stream uh, or broadcast is if you've decided to show that, the OWL can show that as well as the bottom layer here of the instructors and instructional assistant view who are in the front of the classroom. So this is just the OWL view. Um, and then not all the instructors are using OWLs in the classroom. Um, I think that there are some benefits and drawbacks of using an all-in-one device. Some uh, instructors have been using their own laptops or district issued laptops and so you can see those two views on the right side there, laptops one and two, uh, pointing in different directions. Um, you can also use an iPad or a tablet, and honestly, their microphones look very well with the audio, maybe a little bit better than the OWL does. And um, when you're in Zoom, uh, as the instructor, or in our case, we're very lucky to have instructional assistance in every high flex classroom right now. Um, somebody needs to make sure to select who is spotlighted for the Zoom students. Um, so if the teacher is speaking in front of the classroom, then generally that would be the um, instructional assistant who would make sure that that view or that camera is spotlighted. So the Zoom students can say the same thing that the online students or the in-person students are seeing at the same time. Um, so here is kind of a, a view of, I believe this was during my demonstration, I was sharing my screen, and then uh, our faculty member who is serving as our instructional assistant for this demo was making sure to spotlight my video also while I was sharing the screen. Is there anything more you wanted to add to that, Ingrid? I noticed you unmuted, so. Um, no, you, you really captured it. The spotlighting is great when um, I want to record my class uh, Zoom session and then provide it um, in my Canvas course later for students who couldn't make it to class. So that's very useful. Um, and one of the big pitfalls <laughs> that we've noticed in our high flex classrooms is the whiteboard. Now that the faculty are back in the classroom with a whiteboard, I think it's just teacher instinct. You wanna grab the marker and just start writing on the whiteboard. It's so exciting to be able to have that kinesthetic 
experience with your face-to-face -face students finally in the classroom, but it's so important to keep in mind that most of our cameras that are pointed towards the front of the classroom have a very hard time picking up marker on whiteboard. There's a glare from the whiteboard. It's not high definition enough. It may not be focused in enough. And so really the better experience for both the face-to-face -face students and the Zoom students is to use the Zoom whiteboard option, or maybe just share your screen with a Google document just like you would on Zoom if all you had was Zoom students and make sure that is projected to the classroom white, to the classroom screen so that everybody in both modalities can see it. Another big issue we have, even if the, the teacher is projecting their handout or something onto the screen of their classroom, they want to go over and gesture at the screen in front of the class, which leaves out the Zoom contingent. And nobody on Zoom knows what the teacher is pointing at. You know, they can see the teacher's screen, but they don't see the teacher's hand in the classroom necessarily. So using the annotation features within Zoom's whiteboard is a much more effective um, strategy if you have both face-to-face -face and Zoom students simultaneously. So this is Ingrid's example. I'll let her explain. Uh, how she is using the Zoom whiteboard in her class. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, on the left is um, a Zoom whiteboard. And because I teach beginning ESL high flex, I open my class with, you know, what the day of the week is and the date and my students help me write it out. We um, practice pronunciation. Um, and then on the right, um, near the end of class, we do a dictation. And so on the right hand side, the students are helping me spell after we've done um, the spelling practice and dictation. And again, I'm using the Zoom whiteboard. So um, what's great about the Zoom whiteboard is my students on in the Zoom audience can see it. And then the second audience, my students on campus, I'm projecting the Zoom whiteboard on a screen in the classroom. So my students sitting in the classroom, they get a great view as well. So both audiences are getting a crystal clear view of this Zoom whiteboard. Oh, and then instead of using hand gestures, I do use the Zoom annotation tools and that <laughs> takes over. So I'm not making hand gestures that um, the students on Zoom can't see. So the Zoom annotation tools play a huge role in HyFlex. Okay, and I'll be talking about what's happening with the ESL program HyFlex classes. Um, so currently we have 33 HyFlex classes um, offered and the majority of the classes are ESL uh, level one and level two. We also offer, uh, offer a few online learning uh, vessel and citizenship classes. Um, and we are adding more late start classes this month and next um, since we have a long wait list for beginning levels. Uh, last time when I checked, uh, there were about 80 um, students on the wait list for beginning literacy one class. Um, and we cannot enroll any new students after the first census date, uh, which was at the end of September. Um, and out of the 33 high flex classes, we had to uh, convert a few uh, high flex um, classes into fully online um, due to in class attendance. But for the remaining um, classes, uh, high flex classes that we have, we do see an increasing number of in class students uh, comparing to the beginning of the semester. Uh, so students do get encouraged to go back to school uh, because they see other students are doing so. Um, technology. Uh, we have 28 OWL cameras in total for the ESL program. Uh, we have more than enough. We have at least one OWL camera in each HyFlex classroom. Uh, instead of using the OWL camera, um, teachers can also choose to use a webcam uh, or their uh, laptop. And uh, our district provides the Logitech C920 webcams um, and also uh, laptops for instructors and instructional assistants. Uh, we also have the lavalier mics uh, that teachers can choose to use or not. Uh, and we also have the uh, document camera that is compatible with Zoom. 
Um, so uh, the teachers do need to uh, set up the um, document camera. They have to follow the instructions and we have the link of the instruction at the last um, slide. Um, and we also have tripods in each uh, high flex classroom that can hold either the owl device or the webcam. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, we, uh, we ordered some permanent installed cameras in July 2021 that will be installed uh, on the ceiling of the classroom, and we will be receiving some of the technology soon. Um, Ingrid, can you go to the next page? Thank you. So, um, and we've been providing professional development for our high flex pioneers. So here is a list of trainings and supports that we have. Um, so we, um, we are offering high flex orientation for all registered students. So during the orientation, students will learn uh, what is high flex class, um, how to communicate with their teacher and get class information via email. Um, how to use Zoom and log into Canvas, and the, the project assistants uh, who lead these orientations will also help the students who will study uh, only on their mobile devices to download the Zoom app and the Canvas app during the orientation. Um, so our technology coordinator, Monica Cueva, and I offer three open lab sessions uh, for the high flex teachers before the fall semester starts. So teachers learn how to use the OWL camera and uh, practice a little bit with uh, connecting the OWL to the podium computer and setting up all the technology they need for their class. Uh, Jessica Bernardo Swal, our online faculty mentor, and Monica Cueva and I also hosted two uh, instructional aid trainings. Uh, in the training, the IAs learned how to um, support the high flex instructors um, and also some Zoom basics like how to create breakout rooms, uh, how to use annotate tools, and how to spotlight the teacher's video as necessary. Um, we also provided on-site support for high flex teachers for the first two weeks of school, um, just to answer some questions, uh, ease nerves and troubleshoot uh, when necessary. And we are uh, keep providing the on-site support for new high flex teachers as well. Um, this semester, we also created the high flex meetup group. Uh, that meets every other week. And this is a uh, great opportunity for teachers to brainstorm ideas, um, share best practices and ask questions. Uh, we also created two separate pronto groups. Uh, one is for the instructors and one is for the IAs. So um, this is also another way for people to communicate with each other and ask questions. Um, and the last one, high flex teachers can also sign up for weekly ESL uh, tech or high flex mentoring to get help with any uh, high flex or online teaching issues. And we also created many job aids and video tutorials. So you will find all those resources on the last page of the links. Sorry to interrupt, Gia. We do have a couple of questions in the oh, chat. Okay. okay. Um, uh, the first one is from Jill. Can you talk about how an interactive whiteboard could be used in a high flex modality? Are we using any interactive whiteboards right now for ESL? Do you know? Uh, ESL. Whiteboard. I'm not aware it, of any ESL classes using interactive whiteboards. Maybe the DSPS class is using it it's possible yeah we don't have very many within our program so mm -hmm. yeah sorry we don't have a lot of first-hand knowledge with how that works with zoom and or if it works with zoom um, if the I interactive yeah. whiteboard could be connected could log into the zoom class that would be one way to do it and i'm not familiar with that so um, it's worth exploring though for sure yeah, if anybody has any more experience with interactive whiteboards, go ahead and write it in the chat. Hopefully we can uh, have, have some answer to give to Jill. Um, the next question is from Carl. Did you use digital pens when using Zoom whiteboards? I have not been using a digital pen. 
on Zoom whiteboards. And I will say I was promised that we will soon receive iPads. And when we do, I'm going to be using a digital pen. I'm looking forward to that, to handwriting. Um, so that'll be a great way to use a digital pen on the Zoom whiteboard. Um, I personally used an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil in a Zoom meeting, and it worked well. I haven't tried it in the high flex scenario, but I think it would work mm -hmm. quite well. Yeah, I, I think it would be a great thing to do. Um, I do, while we're still on this slide, I do want to point out in this photo, in this slide, um, this is um, during the first week of the semester, and as Gia Sun said, um, our instructors and our instructional aides, um, they were nervous, right? This was brand new. They were pioneering this new technique, this new approach. So I, I visited um, one of our campuses and here I am um, helping out the instructor and the instructional aide um, mm -hmm. get ready to teach their first high flex class. I also wanna point out, we've been mentioning the OWL device. If you look in this photo, it, the OWL device is sitting on the corner of that desk near the left side of the photo. And it stands about five inches tall and it looks like an owl with big eyes because those eyes are the cameras that move around. And um, you know, the cameras don't move around, there's software that helps um, them capture different images in the classroom. So if you're wondering what the owl device looks like, it's sitting there um, on the corner of that table on the left side of this photo. Um, Diana Vera Alba wrote in the chat about um, she's had some experience or um, K through eight schools use interactive whiteboards a lot. Um, and also she had one in her classroom at Sweetwater Adult School previously. Diana, are you able to unmute? I, I'm not sure what attendees have privileges. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yes, I like, did have an interactive whiteboard, but I definitely did not have an owl. So that technology was not available to us back then. But um, interactive whiteboards typically have a pen. Somebody mentioned um, a digital pen. So they have pens and some of them, um, the instructor can use their finger. Um, so, yeah, but typically they do have some kind of pen. It's very similar to the annotations we have in Zoom, where um, you can use, in Zoom we use the mouse and on the interactive whiteboard we had a digital pen similar to what we have like on our iPads, like the magic pen on iPads. Um, and so, but it, didn't have a camera, you, you would have had to have a camera on your computer and it would have had to be similar to our podiums, how we have at our district, it would have had to be installed on, the camera would have had to have been installed on the laptop or podium, so, or the owl somewhere nearby, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Diana, appreciate that overview of interactive whiteboards. Um, this next slide is about the HyFlex pilot. We decided to do a survey early on in the semester so we could capture feedback quickly from our instructors so we could pivot um, our professional development and our support very quickly. Um, and I'm showing there's a, a Zoom class or a Zoom meeting here of our some of our HyFlex instructors and um, you can see we're at a meetup, I believe, Gia. Um, and so this is, these are some of our instructors who have been pioneering the high flex support. Um, so I'm going to share some survey results. 13 faculty answered as of September 21st. Um, two of the instructors taught citizenship ESL classes. One of the instructors taught DSPS, a disability class, and there were a total of 11 ESL classes represented. So um, here is some of the results. What technology would you like to order to support 
high flex instruction. So the most frequently requested tech support requested was webcam. 11 instructors or 85% of our sample, they requested a webcam in addition to the OWL device or in addition to their laptop. Um, then seven instructors requested a second microphone because um, the OWL device, sometimes the microphone wasn't picking up the classroom audio sufficiently. Um, so some of the instructors, 54% of the instructors were requesting another microphone. Um, then three of the instructors requested a laptop and um, they, uh, that was 23%. So these were um, some of the hardware that was requested, webcams, a second microphone, and a laptop. And again, this was very early on in the first or second week of our semester. The next question from the survey, what kind of professional development would you like to request for you as an instructor and your instructional aid? So the number one requested professional development was for troubleshooting the audio. Um, frequently um, the audio between the OWL device and a laptop or a teacher co podium computer, frequently there were screeching noises, echo noises, all kinds of those noises you might hear at a live event. Um, and so 10 instructors, 77% said they would like more training around troubleshooting the audio for themselves. They also reported that they would like to see their instructional aides to receive support. So 62% of the instructors requested that our instructional aides get support for troubleshooting audio. So based on these um, two survey questions, we put a lot of energy and support into field testing, different types of microphone, different ways of handling the audio on campus and how it conveyed in the Zoom audience. Um, what time is it? Okay, so we're almost near the end here. And I have some testimonial comments, um, but I'm thinking I'd like to open the floor to, well, maybe we should do recommendations. I'm gonna skip these testimonials and everyone has access to the link. You can read these testimonials on your own. And what we'd like to do now is bring your attention to our recommendation slides. So, um, if you're thinking of implementing HyFlex or you're in the process, before your college or organization starts a HyFlex um, program, um, we recommend that you acquire, install, and field text the HyFlex hardware, the video, the microphones, the laptops, and the tablets. Um, it's a little bit like, mm, you're managing a concert. You've got to figure out all the sound systems so that the audience doesn't hear that feedback noise um, from the different microphones and speakers. Then um, in our classrooms, there's a teacher podium with a computer and a projector. Uh, we found as our instructors returned to the classroom, many of the teacher podium computers, the operating system software was out of date and needed to be updated. And in some cases, the CPU, the computer had to be replaced as well. Also, we found that the projectors, um, they, they were kind of blurry and they were not as sharp as we would like um, when we want to project either a Zoom whiteboard or the Zoom audience. So um, you might need to update your projectors. The other things we noticed um, is you need to practice how will the teacher be present in the high flex class when they're um, in the classroom and they're uh, also on Zoom because it's really easy for the teacher to leave the field of the camera. And then there's like what I call the ghost presenter. Oh, and by the way, it's Halloween's coming up. So <laughs> ghost presenter fits in really well. Um, the other thing to consider is what type of student interaction are you looking for? Are you going to be asking students who are on, on campus in the classroom, 
do you want them to interact with the students who are on Zoom? But so do you want students between the two audiences interacting or will you be asking students in the classroom to interact and then separately the students on Zoom will interact and do pair and group work? Also, um, before and during the pilot, um, please consider professional development. How will you customize your prof professional development to serve your instructors? your classified professionals who are gonna be supporting this effort. Um, while we were field testing microphones and the OWL device and other methods, we invited our instructors to observe, to be part of either the Zoom audience or the classroom audience. So that was extremely helpful for them to be either a participant in one of the audiences or to observe. And we recorded all of those Zoom um, uh, trainings. Also, we gave them hands-on training with hardware and um, practice with some of the HyFlex instruction. Uh, we also came up with HyFlex meetups. And this is really modeled on something that's been working ever since the pandemic. Um, the ESL program has uh, very, very active meetup groups for the beginning, intermediate, and advanced levels in ESL. And it's on a volunteer basis, and our instructors are very passionate about showing up and presenting their best practices. So we thought we would extend these meetups into the high flex professional development. Um, also, at some of these meetups, we would invite office managers and classified professionals to help answer questions. Um, as we returned to campus, there were simple things that would come up like, where can I park? Do I need a parking pass? Um, who's going to open the classroom? How do I get keys? All these return to campus questions were coming up. And so it was super helpful to have classified professionals joining us in these trainings, professional development. Um, the other recommendation is um, providing instructional assistance support in the high flex class. I, I'm currently teaching a beginning ESL high flex class. I cannot imagine teaching it without support from an instructional assistant. They play such a huge role. They help me with Zoom breakout rooms. They help me um, with student sign in and also with um, students vaccination clearance or testing clearance before they enter the class. Um, also, we highly recommend reporting your pilot findings on a regular basis to the different stakeholders, the academic and classified senates, um, all the academic programs from ESL to automotive to sewing, um, whatever adult ed programs you have, communicate your findings frequently. Um, also, keep in touch with all the district distance educators, your administrators, and um, your deans. We need to keep them in the loop. And our union leadership, and a, a quick side note, our union leadership wrote a side letter, and it wasn't an exact match to what we're doing. And so um, we're going to be reaching out to them again to help us with that. Also, accessibility is extremely important, um, as we all know. And so make sure you're in dialogue with your resource team for accessibility. Um, so um, some more recommendations. One thing I, I think Gia, Jessica, and I, we can, one, one thing we can say is we didn't consider um, student services enough. Um, so I, we recommend that you include them early on in your planning because um, we have a clearance list that gets emailed to us if we are high flex instructors, but um, like we didn't really get a job aid or training on how to interpret the uh, clearance list and um, it isn't obvious what the instructor role is. So if I'm standing in my classroom and there's a line of students about to enter, how do I screen them? Um, do I have to print out that list? 
and then do I need the student to show me their student ID? So there's a lot of um, details that go into uh, reviewing that student clearance list when you're teaching on campus for high flex. Um, so we do recommend that um, it, that we avoid or minimize the amount of time and effort an instructor needs to invest in screening students because that takes a lot of effort. And when you're teaching beginning ESL like I am, how many languages do we find in a beginning ESL class, right? Right now I've got at least nine different languages and sometimes it's a little hard to communicate um, to those low literacy students and, and uh, their vaccination requirements. Um, and also continue working with your accessibility resource team. So Jessica and Gia, I think th that was the end of the recommendations. Did you wanna add anything to that? We just got our five minute warning, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. FYI. All right, and the la I'll just close with this kind of revelation I had just a few days ago. Teaching high flex and planning for high flex has really been a soft launch for reopening our campuses. We have been pushing the limits in our as high flex pioneers, we've been pushing and brushing up against the limits of what our capacity is as we return to campus. And um, everything from when do the doors open, when is the front desk open, um, and how can students get their questions answered when they're on campus, um, when uh, how late is the janitor? I teach an evening course and um, when does the class get locked down or when does the campus get locked down and things like that. So we are learning together. It's an amazing collaboration between faculty, staff, administration and students. And um, as we pioneer this, um, the most important thing is um, collaborating together and staying in communication. So now we'd like to open the floor to any comments or questions. And if we don't have any, maybe we can run our Zoom poll now that we have, looks like we have 22 people with us now. Sure, I just launched it. <clears throat> there you go. All right, so if everyone could um, answer the Zoom poll and that will help us understand um, your level novice, intermediate or advanced. And um, next time we offer some kind of training or do a presentation, we can orient our training that way. So I know some of you need to peel away and take off. Thank you for answering our Zoom poll. Um, glad I'm hearing fantastic information. Thank you for that in the chat. And um, I can, oh, we're at 78% participated. I can end and share. Yep, you can end and share now. Okay. Okay. So in our group today, we either have novice or intermediate. None of us are advanced. <laughs> um, that makes sense. All right. Well, thank you for answering our poll. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for navigating some of the tech speed bumps earlier. We really appreciate you joining us. And we look forward to hearing from you and your evaluation. Thank you. Definitely. and I know that we have this recording so if you miss the first part of it right Mandalay they can go back and watch the recording later is that right yes absolutely um so I do extend apologies for the glitch on the back end but I am happy that we were able to get a um, a good handful of people and more than a handful of people in um, shortly thereafter we started. For those of you that did miss the first 10-15 um, minutes the recording once processed will be posted on the v site. You can find that under the agenda next to the session and it should have a play button there. 
Additionally, if you were not able to grab that link with all of the resources shared by the HyFlex team here, you can also find that under the agenda. Um, grab that link there as well. Um, we thank you for concluding. This is our last session on our first day of the CAPE 2021 Summit. Thank you so much for everyone joining and participating. Um, be sure to join us first thing tomorrow morning. We have our plenary speaker. Um, and in those off times, we ask that you check out the photo booth and have some fun with that. <clears throat> Um, connect with some colleagues statewide in the networking lounge. You can create your own private chat rooms. And then if there's any technical difficulties that come up, definitely um, chat us in the VFAIRS technical support or in that blue kind of chat icon button, uh, which is how we found out we had a glitch and were able to get on that right away. So thank you, um, Ingrid, Gia, and Jessica. It was a wonderful presentation and lots of great information. Thank and you. Thank so you, Mandalee, thank for you. being our tech host today. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. All right, ladies, have a good rest of your evening and thank you all for joining us. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.